Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I've titled this message, Cake Plus Biscuit Equals Cookies. Cake plus biscuits equals cookies. Now, you look terrified. That doesn't doesn't look like the ingredients will work that way, does it? It, it, It's going to work that way. Watch watch what happens. Genesis chapter 2. Now, if we'll confess, we'll be honest about this particular scripture we're going to read. Verse 24. Therefore, can you say therefore? Therefore. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast, cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so, Father, we'll ask your blessing over the reading of the word, for the hearing of our ear, and the receiving of our heart. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Now, if we want to be honest, this particular scripture probably never comes up in our minds or in our hearts or in our lives. Did you lose a bet? You, You lost a bet, didn't you? It's your birthday today? Yesterday? Is, is, this, is this the bet you lost? I mean, I would have preferred, I would have done the cold water challenge or something. I, <laughs> Lexi, I love you. Uh, oh, Lexi, I like it. Keep it up. And be careful, I might take it away from you. This particular scripture we just read. It really rarely comes up in our lives or in our thought process unless we're at a wedding. And we always hear the scripture in a wedding. And if we're honest, we hear the scripture and we go, man, I'm not really sure what all that means, leave, cleave, and weave. I, you know, what is that all about? How does that work? What's going on inside of those particular things? It's just, it's just different in those things. And so how, how does cake plus biscuit equals cookies? Well, it's interesting. I want to show you, like, here is the ingredients of chocolate cake, dinner rolls, and how it equals sugar cookies. They have the same ingredients in them. Chocolate cake has the same ingredients plus a couple of extra, as biscuits do. Sure they do. Somebody say amen. amen. It all starts with flour. We've got to start with flour, and we have to add ingredients into it, right? And so we've got salt, we've got shortening, we've got vanilla. Well, maybe you don't want to, if you're making biscuits, maybe you don't put vanilla in your mix. Or maybe you like your biscuits to take like vanilla. I don't know. You could be weird. <laughs> Milk, uh, Flour, salt, butter, baking soda, eggs, cocoa, all this kind of stuff, baking powder. We could just throw it all in there, no particular order. Just throw it all in there and see what's going on, how that works. There's some ingredients there for chocolate cake and biscuits. Now, we can make both of those issues, both of those things, out of those ingredients. Sure we could. So what does this have to do with marriage? Well, I'm glad you asked. You people are pretty perceptive. The development of marriage comes in, three, in a three-step process. You've got to grab this. Now, in all the years that we've been teaching on marriage, right, these ten, last 10 years we were just pushed in to say once a year we're going to focus on marriage. We're going to talk about it, right, what it looks like, how the Scripture talks about it, what society looks at it, those particular things. The development of marriage is a three-step process. Let me tell you why I think this is important. Because for 15 years we've been doing marriage counseling. People come into our office with their lives ruined, marriage wrecked, all these kind of things go on. Let me tell you why I think marriage is important. I was in England, and I was standing on Hadrian's Wall, right? That, that's the end of the Roman Empire, Hadrian's Wall, right there. That's it. On the other side of this wall were the barbarians, the Scots, okay, if you know your history. And from Hadrian's Wall in England all the way to Egypt, that was the Roman Empire. Huge. You can look out on a map and go, man, that's big. But nothing is like standing geographically in a place and going, this was the end of the Roman Empire, and turn around and looking and saying, everywhere from here to Egypt, that was Rome. What? Huge, vast empire, huge military, well off economically. Politically, they had it down. All these things were going on. They had running water. They had heated water. They had all the things in society that other cultures did not have. They were the, the, they had conquered the known world. Yet this empire no longer exists. How could this happen? And so I was reading a guy who spent 20 years of his life studying 
the Roman Empire. And he gives, he laid out, just in case you think he's some kind of quack, he, he has a PhD, he's a doctorate in history, and he studied the Roman Empire for 20 years. And he studied why the empire collapsed. Why this economic machine, this military power, all, all of this political influence and everything that they had, how did it collapse? How does it no longer exist? He lists the number one reason, there's ten reasons, but his number one reason for why the Roman Empire failed was divorce. This is a secular history teacher. He said the number one reason was the way the Roman culture began to look at marriage and the family unit. And when they allowed that to dissolve, when they allowed that to go away, when they allowed that to be destroyed, it was the beginning of something that could not be turned around. And if you and I will face it, and we will be honest today, in the world that we live in, in our society today, marriage is as disposable as the razor you use every morning. It is easier in this society to get a divorce than it is to get a driver's license. It, it is easier in this society to get a passport than it is or to get a divorce than it is to get a passport. It's easier in this society to get a divorce than it is for my wife to get back in the country. We're trying to come home from Vancouver in the Vancouver airport. The U.S. Customs border is in the airport. You have to go through it there. There are U.S. Customs officers, right? You've got to go to the computer, fill out all the paperwork. You know, do you got money? Did you contact animals? Are you, you know, all that kind of stuff. You've got to answer yet. No, 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 all this stuff. Is your name. They take a picture of it. They give you a little paper. So I've got mine. I'm standing in line. I'm good to go. You know, it's all clear and clean and that kind of thing. My wife comes back over, and she's got her, her, fold, her, her paper, and she looks at me. She says, what does this big X across my face mean? <laughs> and I read below and it says, see a U.S. Customs Border Agent. And I was like, every time. I just died laughing right there. Why? Because she's born in Thailand. She looks Spanish. Her name is Lisa Smith. Yet she's a citizen, a U.S. citizen. They always go, yeah, right. Even, we were in Vancouver, even in Vancouver, someone came up to her and started speaking Spanish, and she's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no habla espanol, <laughs> barely habla inglés. <laughs> she's got this picture I could not resist. It was hilarious. So we go through there, and the guy just asks a couple of questions to let us on through. It always happens that way. No big deal. I've learned to rest and relax in it. I, to, to, finally. This is a culture and a society that doesn't value marriage. It doesn't value it. This is a culture and a society that will press, fuss, bark, and, and, and violate everybody so that people can get married while in the same time they don't value marriage. Y'all catch that a little bit later. I mean, I don't understand why the big fuss is about making sure everybody can get married when you don't care if they stay married. When you make it easier for them to get unmarried than you do for them to get married. The development of marriage is a three-step process. Number one, first, the man and the woman's got to leave their parents. Leave. Can you say leave? leave. Get out. In biblical times, a son would stay in the father's house. Why? Because at his father's death, it belonged to him anyway. He inherited it. Right? However, he's got to leave his parents. He's got to cleave to his wife. What does that mean? How does he do that? If he's staying in his father's house, how does he leave his parents and cleave to his wife? How does that work? You've, you're focused on the geographical moving of a location when you should be focused on the spiritual movement of your heart. 
What it means is that her, his primary focus now is not to be raised and provided for by his parents anymore. His primary focus is her. That means he's got to grow up. No more laying around picking your nose and playing video games. I mean, uh, whatever it is. She's his primary focus. Do you know in Deuter- it's so important in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 7, that if a man was in the military, the military gave him a leave of absence for one year when he got married. One year. We tell our young people all the time here, you get married, listen, take a year. Enjoy being married, that kind of thing. At the end of that year... Right? We're going to put some weight on you. Dan and Libby didn't always tell you that. We told them that. Right? Sarah and Tyler are about to get the same speech. Take a year. Be married. We want to put some weight on you after that. Not a ton. But we, we know you're leaders. We know you are. We want to see you step up. Okay? So that's the aspect of it. The second step here is, to, is this consisted of cleaving or being joined to your spouse. What does it mean? See, both words mean to be close to your spouse, but this cleaving means to, to be a protective close. It means to, to shelter, to, to, to you know, cover and protect your spouse upon your marriage becomes your closest person, the closest person to you. Like that means cut the apron string. That means, guys, you got to cut the apron strings from mom. And that means your wife ain't supposed to be your mom either. That means, ladies, you have to follow your husband. Well, this is... I've got to go. We got a baptism. To... <laughs> if the first two are done correctly, we've spent 10 years preaching on this, 15 years counseling it. If the first two are done correctly, then the third literally becomes a reality. Two become one. Remember last year we talked about God's math? One plus one equals what? One. Man, you guys remembered. One plus one equals one. That's God's math. Right? That's the way it works in marriage. This is what God is doing. He's trying to bring us together. This means more than just physically in the marriage bed or physically living in the same house. See, the goal here is to leave the parents, join and become one flesh. That perfect union. The two terms I want you to concentrate on as we try to go through this quickly is this. There is a direct teaching and an indirect teaching. And your life has been a result of both. So, is it possible to really leave and to really cleave? Is it possible? I mean, that's a great question to ask because we, we want to be in a sober mind as we think about this. See, if, if you're like me and my wife, maybe you aren't. But see, we, we never lived in our own hometowns. We got married. We lived, right? Like we got in an argument. She couldn't go back home. I couldn't go my dad wouldn't, if, I, if we got in an argument, I pulled up in my dad's yard, he would have said, turn your, and go. <laughs> I got rid of you once. We never lived in our own hometowns. In a, in a physical sense, we, we left our parents to be joined together. We, we couldn't run to them, and those type of things. See, we're not always at our parents' house instead of spending time with each other. No, I'm not against it. Don't, please hear me with your good ears this morning. The question I'm asking is, have we met the, have we met the first requirement? See, to leave, to leave father and mother, to be joined to your spouse is more than just physically moving in together and leaving away. Right? Is this a, there's a commitment that's, that's put to it that's, depth, that's at the depth of spirituality. That's why cohabitation is not in God's plan. That's why God calls it a sin, because you, you get the benefits of marriage without the commitment to what God is asking. And that's why it doesn't last very long. 
It also means that there are some things we've learned from our parents that we've got to walk away from in order to be completely joined. Sure it does. This is the question that I want you to consider today, right here in this plane. What influence do your parents have on your marriage right now that needs to be removed? Y'all can say, oh boy, or amen, or oh me. You say, well, what are you talking about, Don? All right. Indirect teachings, direct teachings, whatever you want to do. My dad, when he would wash the car. Now, we lived on a dirt road. We lived on dirt road. Dirt. Can you say dirt? Y'all got dirt roads around here? We lived on dirt. I'm not talking about gravel roads. I'm talking about dirt roads. Sand pit roads. And when my dad would wash the car, I always noticed he'd go outside, and he'd spend 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, he would spend just soaking down the ground around the car before he ever washed the car. He would soak the ground down around the car. And, and, and eventually, one day, I, I'd see him do this, and I'm like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be washing the car, not the dirt. Right? Dirt is dirty, and no matter how much you wash it, it's still going to be dirt. And Dad says, that if you think about it, son, it makes perfect sense. If I wet this car and I walk around it to start washing it on dry, dirt ground, it's going to kick up dust, and I can wash this car all day long, and it's not going to get clean. But if I wet the ground, then I'm walking on top of ground that's not dusty anymore, and when I wash the car, the dust doesn't get back on the car. Right? Like Donnie told me one time that he literally pays a guy to go in front of his his house, and I mean, it's brilliant what you do up here. Put, and, and they oil, they put oil on the dirt road to keep the dust down. I thought it's brilliant. Right? So my dad would do that, and I, I, I watched him do those type of things. And he used to hate when he washed the car, wet the car, and dust would get back on it right away. I hate that. Do you hate that? I hate that. Like I just washed this thing. How many, how many of you, come on kids, be honest with you, the kids that the windows inside the car fog up and you ride on the windows? Like my dad hated that. My dad, he would lecture us, don't do that. Don't ride on it. Going down the road, you know how you try to figure out how to write backwards so the people outside can read it, you know? Like help. And we go down the road one day and it's all fogged up, you know, and I'm trying to write on there, help, I'm kidnapped on there. And my dad is like, stop it. Don't do that. It wasn't that he minded the people glaring at the car when we stopped at a red light, you know. I mean, those times. No, it's just when the window dries, guess what's still on the window? Help, I'm kidnapped. It doesn't go away with the fog. My dad hated that. And so then I grew up, you know, my dad, he lectured me about it. Don't do that. And I told my dad right there, I said, you know what? When I grow up and get married, I'm going to let my kids write in the fog on the window all they want to. I never realized until now how big a liar I was back then. I hate it when they do that. Don't do that. Melinda's grown up and she still does it. (laughs) Did I get that from my father? Or is that just natural for an adult to want to have clean windows in the car? Ah, hang with me. Have you ever heard somebody say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? Hang with me. See, we are products of our environment. You can say amen. Whether good or bad, that's who we are. Products of our environment. And what happens is two people get married... And they are both products of their own environment. And then they bring their normal into marriage. Although you look the same, if you had been raised in a different house, you would be a totally different person. Sure you would. Absolutely you would. Yep, because the way you think, all of that. See, when we're born, we got the physical, genetic, and makeup of our parents. But we are like the raw ingredients of flour. Whatever else is added to that then begins to create the end product. 
Now, what we become depends on what's done with the ingredients that's added to us as we grow and live. So if I started with just flour and I add sugar, eggs, cocoa, butter, and a few other ingredients, then I can wind up with a chocolate cake. But if I add something different, I might, add up with, I might end up with biscuits. When two people with two different backgrounds marry, it's the same as cake marrying a biscuit. According to the word of God, the cake and the biscuit must now become one. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Try to cut the cake in half, put the biscuit in the middle and smash it back down. There we go. All we've got is a smeared cut in half cake with a dry biscuit in the center. In marriage, that's exactly what God is asking us to do. Remember I said as babies, as people, as young people, we like flour and the other ingredients, both good and bad, they make us into cake or cookie. Now, what would happen if you were able to remove some of those ingredients and mix in others? You wouldn't necessarily have chocolate cake and biscuits. You might end up with something completely different. By changing a few ingredients and not adding certain ingredients, you take what chocolate cake and biscuits are at their core, and you could turn that both into sugar cookies. Something just as good. We are the physical result of our parents coming together. The ingredients may not have all been the best or the positive, yet they continue to influence us today. Sure they do. We blame a lot of our dysfunction and conflict not on our responsibility in the marriage we're in now, but on the way our parents treated us or lived their marriage out in front of us. That's why when we try to bake a cake as a couple, we wound up with a fallen cake. When we marry, we've got to choose the ingredients that we have in our lives to keep based on the outcome we want and the ingredients to give up in order to have the outcome we want. Just because you have all of those ingredients don't mean you have to mix them in the bowl of your marriage. If you bring an ingredient into your marriage that is going to create your marriage something other than what you both want, that's not your parents' fault. That's not the world's fault. That's not anybody else's fault. That's your fault. You put it in the bowl. Don't put it in the bowl. You're making chocolate cake, you're not going to pour ammonia in. God's word points to the importance of parents' role in developing of children. Proverbs chapter 22 says what? Raise a child up in the way he should go, and when he gets old, he won't depart from it. That's individualizing children. I don't know if you realize that. That's not standardizing children. That's individual. It didn't say raise, a ch raise children up in the way they should go. It says raise a child up in the way he should go. Each individual. Listen, because I love my children the same, I treated them different. My son would come up to me and say, you never treated Malin that way. I said, you're not a girl. <laughs> One day you're going to have hair on your chest, and she ain't. Get over it. Doesn't mean y'all love you any less than her. I love you the same. But I, I'm trying to honor Proverbs. Your gift is different than hers. Her gift is different than yours. And I've got to raise you up in the honor, righteousness, and, and love of the Lord. But it's going to look totally different. Ephesians chapter 6, 4 says, Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Somebody say, hello. 
But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Parents have the primary responsibility for training children. And this training comes from a direct teaching and an indirect teaching. See, direct teaching is when we sit a child down and we teach them something specifically. We sit down, Rasika, and we say, Rasika, I'm going to sit you down here and I'm going to teach you that 2 plus 2 equals 4. She's going to say, how do I do that? You're going to take these two and these two and you're going to have four. She's going to say, oh, I've got it. That's pretty simple, isn't it? We're not going to say, Rasika, sit down. We're going to take two plus two minus one equals three plus two more equals five minus one equals four. You've got the answer, right? Two plus two, that's four. We're not going to do that. Making something more complicated than it has to be doesn't make our children more educated. I'm just a redneck. I got a little political on you. You didn't even know it. That's a direct teaching. An indirect teaching. Are you with me? occurs when a child learns to do something by watching what we do. And we get mad at them. We say, where'd you learn to do that? And they go, from you. Indirect teaching. For, for example, let me just give you a couple, and i got to go because we've got, got some stuff to do here. No parent sits down and teaches their little boy to smack around little girls. which would be a direct teaching. We don't do that. However, little boys have learned to smack around their wives by watching their dad do it. Father didn't set out with the goal of teaching his son directly to do that. For example, a mother doesn't teach their daughter to take that kind of abuse directly. But her daughter might learn that that's okay because of what her mom has endured and continues to endure. There's no reason for that. Y'all not helping me. No reason for physical abuse. The elders can help adjust that with prayer around the head and neck area. These are extreme cases to make a point. I know that, and I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to be brash or uncompassionate. What I'm saying is we learn as much from our parents through direct teaching as we do through indirect teaching. And oftentimes it's the indirect teaching that causes the most trouble in our marriages. We wonder what's going on, and when we marry, we bring two people from two different backgrounds together, and each of us bring our normal to it. And, and without a doubt, after people come into my office and they sit down and my wife and I have a couple of weeks with them just kind of seeing where they're at, we always look at them and say, relax, you're normal. And everybody goes, we're normal? Yes, what we want you to be is abnormal. You're not the only one. We, we don't want to rest in the norm of what the world says is okay. No, we want to rest in the norm of what the Lord says. Leave, cleave, and weave. And there'll be one flesh in harmony, walking together, glorifying God in your bodies and in your life together. And your marriage says to the world, Jesus is alive and well. That's abnormal. That's what we're cooking here. The problem is you've brought your ingredients for chocolate cake, you've brought your ingredients for biscuits, and you throw them both in the mixing barrel, and you tried to mix them in what you've called your marriage, and you wondered why it's not coming out sugar cookie. That's good teaching, church. What we grew up with and we're exposed to on a daily basis is what is normal to us. The things abnormal 
They're different from what we're accustomed to. And understanding this is the beginning of oneness in marriage. Understanding this is saying, no, I'm not allowed to stand here in front of my spouse and say, you have to put up with me because of what my parents did to me. That means I'm putting ingredients in the bowl I ought not to. I'm not allowed to do that. Have you ever asked your your spouse this question? Why do you do that? I mean, it's probably a genuine question. But a lot of times we develop habits based on what we've seen our parents do, indirect teaching. And, and your marriage and how you view your marriage is, is, is comprised in some ways of what you learned indirectly. And so we're teaching our kids now, parents, we're teaching our kids now, directly and indirectly, what to do in their marriage. And we've got to be aware of that. My wife and I had some arguments, man, I'm just telling you. Hello, church. You don't want to make a little Thai woman mad. <laughs> you turn into a little chihuahua. <laughs> and you're just like, whoa! Oh! <laughs> Holy smoke. But the one thing we tried to make sure is that our children never saw that. Hello, church. There's a time and a place to disagree, and it's not in front of the children. It's not in front of them. I'm saying we're perfect at it. I'm just saying that was something that was in our heart. Why do you do what you do? A lot of times we base that. And so our marriage and, and how we view it is comprised of those things. We're teaching our kids now. We've got to say, wait a minute. I'm stopping all of this. I'm not putting ammonia in the mix. When you think of your marriage and how you do some things, think about your parents. Did they do it the same way? For example, how did your parents handle conflict? Did they address it openly or did they ignore it? Hoping that the issue would go away? Consider that now, how you deal with conflict. Did what you witness from your parents have any impact on how you do it now? And you probably use that excuse. I hear people all the time say, well, you know, we don't really show uh, emotion in our house because that's just not, that's not the way we were raised. So? Well, my parents never told me they loved me. So? Why are you putting that in your bowl? I never saw my parents be affectionate or hold hands or love one another or, or, or embrace one another or be kind to one another. Every time we saw them, you know, it was just you know, whatever, you know, it was just doing duty. So why are you putting that in the bowl? You're in charge of putting your own ingredients in the bowl. What about the way you expressed emotion? Did your parents express emotions? Were they loud and boisterous or were they inverted and withdrawn? Are you like your parents? <laughs> what about the way your parents celebrate holidays and went on vacation? So much different from Lisa and I. Like I never as a child remember going on vacation, ever, ever. So when we get married, like she did, they went on vacation, they did things together as a family, those type of things. Hello, church. Her dad grilled out in the backyard all the time. We never did that. I grew up in the woods on dirt roads without street lights. Where we killed critters, hung them up in a tree, skinned them out, we ate them. She grew up on military bases, on pavement, in the safety and security of the United States military. We get married... We buy a house out in the woods. There's no street lights. It's, it's dark out there at night. My wife goes, wow, I never knew there were so many stars. Why? Because the street city, city lights drowned them all out. We're, we're, first night we're at home and in our own house together, it's quiet. And the silence is deafening. 
Middle of the night, coyotes got started. My wife sits up in the bed and goes, what's that? I'm like, what's the matter with you, woman? What is that? They're just coyotes. Coyotes? Yeah, just go back to sleep. They're going to get us. I go, we live in a brick house. The next night, middle of the night, the whippoorwills got started. She never heard a whippoorwill before. She sits up in the middle of the night. What's that? It's a whippoorwill. What is that? Is it like Bigfoot? Is it hairy? Does it have teeth? No, it's a bird. It's about this big. It's like an owl. Just, and they would call back and forth to one another all night long. And to me, it's a beautiful sound. It drove her insane. Like she can sleep through police sirens and in the middle of the night, but not through the whippoorwill. That was her normal. This was my normal. No wonder in six months our cake had fallen. All of us at some point in time reflect back on what we knew about our parents relationships and we think the positive and the negative we make decisions about what we want and don't want in our marriage based on what we witnessed in their relationships and and we hold secrets from our spouses about our insecurities based on the things that's happened in our family and how we're growing up and and let me tell you something today if you're doing that if you're holding secrets from your spouse today These insecurities will become a personal trial for you on an everyday basis. Our spouses wonder why we do certain things. We can't explain it or or refuse to because it would reveal, it would reveal a side of us that, that we, you know, my wife, she really didn't ever understand me until we hung out with my family for a weekend. We went away from there, and she was just like, oh, okay, now I see. I never forget, I was behind, one day, we were just married, where I was behind a guy, I was taking her to work, and uh, I was behind a guy in Florida, and it was early in the morning, and he just crunched this dough, man, bang, he hit this dough, boom, fell over, and uh, so... <laughs> I pulled off the side of the road, asked the guy if he's all right. He's like, yeah, man, I'm late for work. I got to go. And so to me, I'm like, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't want that? He's like, no, man, I'm late for work. I got to go. I take the key out of the car, pop the trunk, drag the critter over to the car. <clears throat> in the trunk, my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, when you get home from work this afternoon, we cleaning that. She says, no, we ain't. I said, sure we are. So she got off, got home. It was cool in Florida, cool enough to leave him hanging. And so I brought her out there. I said, now watch. This is how you do it. And my wife's standing there going, no, that's not how I do it. This is how you do it. I'm going back in the house. <laughs> I killed this giant rattlesnake. I mean, it, it was, it's, he's big as my arm this big guy remember that snake Malin? and his head was as big as my fist and she i'm not exaggerating this this snake was huge big beautiful diamondback and it, it, it'd be every bit of you know six foot or more long and so Malin's out there and she's like it, you know it's still moving i'd cut its head off and it, it's still moving and everything and and she's just like standing there's a little bitty girl and i'm like okay now here's what we're gonna do we're gonna skin this snake out she's like gonna do what i said we're gonna skin this snake out I said, I need you to stand on its tail, and I'm going to stretch it out here so I can go down its belly, and we can flay the skin right off of there. And so my daughter stood on this snake's tail, and she was just like, oh! And my wife's like, I can't believe you're making our daughter do this! <laughs> that was the, her normal. It was my normal. My wife goes, now I see. I mean, the first time I met my wife's dad, all the time we were together, she never told me he's a cop. He worked third shift. So we arrived early in the morning at his house. We 
We let ourselves in and we waited for him to get home. About 6.30, he comes walking through the door. Gun on his hip. I'm like, wait a minute. This is not what we talked about. I didn't do it. Nobody saw me and you can't prove a thing. <laughs> Promise, I just got here. Is this her normal? Am I normal? You see what has to happen in marriage is you have to understand. And as I close, okay, as I close, you need to think about the ingredients you've been adding to which make you who you are. What will you have to give up, unlearn, or walk away from in order to be one with your spouse? Can I ask you this question? Can I leave you with this thought today? Can you do it? Can you keep the positive from your parents while modeling some things in order to build something new, different, and wonderful in your life? Sure you can. Leave out the stuff that causes your cake to fall. Be an adult. If you're the chocolate cake and you're married to the biscuit, you got the making for a sugar cookie. And it's just as good. All you got to do is remove some ingredients and join the rest. Come on, church. Are you willing to do it? If you're not married in this place, maybe you're not married because you've been single all your life. Maybe you're not married because you've went through the horrible experience of divorce. You can still become something else by keeping the core of who you are and building the new of what you desire. It's never too late. Can you say never? Never Never too late. Never too late to start building your marriage into what God wants it to be. You've got to decide what ingredients you put in, what ingredients you leave out. Doug's going to come. He's going to close for us.